grace and peace. One more time, Acts chapter 9. This is New Testament video 356, Acts lesson 32. Acts 9. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of grace. We ask that you make this a profitable study as we are mindful of the dispensational layout of Scripture. Thank you. In Christ's name, men. Acts 9. Read the whole chapter with me. Forty-three verses, deep breath. Acts 9, 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus, named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Verse 32, this lesson. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt in Lydda and Sarum saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. <sighs> Acts chapter 9. Acts 9. I think we can finish the chapter here. Thus far in Acts 9, 
we have seen Saul of Tarsus, the rabbinical scholar, leading apostate Israel in its rejection of Jesus Christ in early Acts and its persecution of Christ's believers, the little flock, Israel's believing remnant, the Messianic Jews, Jesus is Messiah, believers. Saul of Tarsus is a maniac. He is spiritually insane, like his nation. No faith, but quite religious, devout, pious. I think it's safe to say Saul of Tarsus would put all religious people to shame today. Find the most religious person you know, my friend. Saul of Tarsus was even better than they are in religion. Hmm. Quite lost, Saul of Tarsus is. Not serving the God of the Bible, although he thinks he is. In the name of religion, Saul of Tarsus imprisons and kills. He has abused, tormented, vexed the Messianic Church in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 8. At the conclusion of chapter 7, there is Saul of Tarsus holding the clothes of Stephen's murderers. The young man Saul of Tarsus In his mind, he's exterminated all the little flock in Jerusalem. Can I go to Damascus now, high priest? You sure can. Go ahead, Saul of Tarsus. Hmm. He secures warrants, letters to Damascus to go to those synagogues way up to the north east. Leave Jerusalem, go to Damascus. Here is Jerusalem, here is Damascus, way in the corner. Five, six days journey away. Whether they're men or women, he will bring the Messianic Jews, he will extradite them back to Jerusalem for punishment. Ruthless, cold, cruel, hmm. Saul of Tarsus, he journeys, traveling along the way, outside of Damascus, Acts 3, 9, suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. He hears a voice, he falls to the earth and he hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Uh-oh. 
I know who that is. That's the God of creation. More than that, Saul. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Oh. Oh. Whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Saul of Tarsus. Receives grace, mercy, and peace when all he deserves is wrath, judgment, and war from the Lord. Saul, you've been quite defiant, stubborn. To Paul here, or Saul of Tarsus, is revealed from heaven's glory by the Lord Jesus Christ a new gospel message. And we must go to Paul's epistles for the details. See, Luke writing Acts as the Holy Spirit leads. Luke does not provide all the information that he could For the details, we consult Romans through Philemon, Bible study. We aren't to be superficial Bible readers. Yeah, let me just read the chapter here. Oh, I did my Bible duty for the day. In order to grow and dig deeper, we search, search the scriptures and locate cross-references, other verses that will expand on the verses we just read. The gospel of the grace of God is revealed to the Apostle Paul here. Remember Acts 22 and Acts 26 or parallel chapters. Acts 9 is Luke's account. Paul's testimony sermons are Acts 22 and Acts 26. Acts 9 has material, not in Acts 22 and not in Acts 26. Acts 22 has material, not in Acts 9 or Acts 26. Acts 26 has information, not in Acts 22 or Acts 9. Read all three. Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. To get the full picture. A new dispensation had to have begun in order to save Saul of Tarsus. The dispensation of the grace of God. The mystery program was entrusted to the Apostle Paul. Okay, this is Saul of Tarsus. And from heaven's glory. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's resurrected ascended and glorified. From heaven's glory, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals to the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, a new program kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Romans 16. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. There's 
a new way to view Jesus Christ. There's one Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture, but he plays two roles in Scripture. There's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the prophetic program, and Jesus Christ according to the mystery program. Paul is the mystery program. The Apostle Paul is the first member of the church, the body of Christ. He is the first person to believe the gospel of grace, the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, verse 24. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. Saul of Tarsus, here in Acts 9, stopped relying on his feeble religious efforts. Works religion can do nothing for me, because I can do nothing for God. There he realized it. And Saul of Tarsus trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Read Philippians 3. The long-suffering, the grace, mercy, and peace given to Saul of Tarsus there, God has extended to the whole world for 20 centuries now. The wrath that should have fallen during Acts did not. Did not. Should have been meted out on Saul of Tarsus, but wasn't. He's the pattern. Acts 9, 6. We have to pick up the pace here. And he trembling, Acts 9, 6, and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Hmm. He's a humble man now, a saved man, God's preacher. At this point onward, He has been dishonorably discharged from the devil's ministry and now installed into Almighty God's ministry. Acts 9, 6, And the Lord said unto Saul, Arise and go into the city, Damascus, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw the man. He's blind. The glory of the Lord blinded him. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Pitiful. And for three days, he can't see, eat, or drink. No food, no drink, no sight. 10. And there is at Damascus here a certain disciple, Ananias. The Lord has a job for you, Ananias. Arise, 11, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So Ananias, a member of the little flock, a Messianic Jew, someone whom Saul of Tarsus originally set out to arrest, the Lord appears to Ananias in a vision. 
Here's your task, Ananias. Go minister to Saul of Tarsus there in Judas' house on Straight Street. Oh no! I don't want to go. Ananias. Get on down to Straight Street. I'm the Lord. You're the servant. Saul is blind. Restore his sight. I don't want to go. Acts 9, 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Ananias is fearful here. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Go thy way, Ananias. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Acts 26. I send thee, Paul, Saul, to the Gentiles. Apostle sent one. Romans 11, 13. Through the fall of Israel... Romans 11. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. That's Saul's ministry. Paul's ministry. Through the fall of Israel, instead of God reaching the world through Israel converted and risen to kingdom glory, God will evangelize the world through Israel's fall. Not rise. Up. But fall down of Israel. And it will be Paul's ministry by which he accomplishes reaching the world through the fall of Israel. Saul will suffer along the way. Hmm. Acts 9, 17. Ananias went into Judas' house, he put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Ananias is a good law-keeping Jew. He has a good reputation amongst the saints, the Jewish saints here in Damascus. The Lord skillfully commissions Ananias to be an independent witness here. Saul is saved. Saul is converted. He is a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Ananias has seen and heard thus far in the vision, as well as these unusual circumstances here in Acts 9, in which Saul finds himself, and Ananias bears record of all of this, that is a, is a testimony to Israel, saved and lost alike, that Saul is the Lord's man now. The Lord Jesus Christ's apostle, minister, servant. Acts 9.18 Ananias identifies with Saul, puts his hands on him, and as it had been scales on Saul's eyes, they fall away. Saul receives his sight forthwith, Acts 9.18. He arose and he was water baptized. Saul has not been made aware yet of the fact 
water baptism is unnecessary in this new dispensation. So he has no capacity to refuse. No, Ananias, I don't need it. Saul doesn't know it yet to refuse the water baptism. Ananias is waiting for a water baptism because up to this point, all believers have been water baptized. So the Lord permits it. So I'll be water baptized. Some more confirmation. So as a believer, okay. Acts 9, 19, he received meat and he was strengthened. He eats. Based on Galatians 1, I believe Paul went out to Arabia. He came back to Damascus. He certain days with the disciples at Damascus. Acts 9.20 And immediately straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? Yes, it is. And came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. They can't believe it. Here was a Jesus Christ hater, and now he's a Jesus Christ preacher. What happened to him? They're startled, perplexed, bewildered. Hmm. What's going on with him? Don't know. Acts 9.23 and after that, many days, Galatians 1.18, three years, in Damascus were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill Saul, but their laying await was known of him. See? And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Saul... You are undergoing just a snippet, just a hint of Satan's policy of evil in which you participated when you tormented those followers of Jesus Christ earlier here in Acts. Satan's policy of evil gets after Saul now. Oh, God changed the program? The average believer today doesn't know it, but Satan does. So the little flock isn't persecuted as much as it used to be. But Saul of Tarsus, he receives the persecution instead. Acts 9, 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Peter and James, the brother of the Lord, half-brother, Galatians 1. And declared unto them how he, Saul, had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. So Saul moves from Damascus to Jerusalem. And you notice, 
after Saul's conversion, he did not meet with the other apostles, the twelve apostles, until three years later. See, he's under a different commission. Saul doesn't inquire of Peter. Now, what does the Lord Jesus require of us? No, the Lord Jesus has already taught Paul, Saul. Directly. Galatians 2. These are two separate apostleships. Peter and Paul. Not to be confused. Not to be combined. Acts 9, 29, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, Greek-speaking Jews. But they went about to slay him. So, his life is threatened in Damascus, and now Jerusalem. He has to flee again. Acts 9, 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Birthplace, Tarsus. They sent him by ship. Get out of here, Saul. And Saul of Tarsus leaves and he disappears from the record of Scripture until chapter 11. Acts 9.31 Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. The little flock. The churches, these Messianic Jew assemblies, they have rest. Saul of Tarsus is now a saved man. No threat to them any longer. Thus far in Acts, we've seen Peter and the eleven, the twelve apostles, Matthias included, Acts 1 to 6. Chapters 1 to 6. Acts 7. Stephen, another member of the little flock. Acts 8. Philip. There's Saul of Tarsus as a lost man there in the closing verses of Acts 7, the opening verses of Acts 8, Saul of Tarsus drops from sight. Here he is in Acts 9 again, and then he's gone. And the Holy Spirit brings back the focus to Peter again. And for the remainder of Acts 9, into chapter 11, it's Peter, Peter, Peter. Luke concentrates on the Apostle Peter's ministry. Acts 9, 32 to 43. There are Peter's two miracles. along the Mediterranean coast. His ministry along the Mediterranean sea there. In chapter 10, Peter's ministry to Gentile Cornelius. And in chapter 11, Peter's defense before the Jerusalem Messianic Church. Hmm. Okay. Acts 9, 32. 
And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda, or Lydda. Peter. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years, and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda, or Lydda, and Saron, or Saron, saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda, or Lydda, was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand, and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive, and it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner, Peter's two miracles. One, a paralytic is healed. Two, a dead woman is raised. Hmm. We will remember thus far Matthew 4, Matthew 4, Matthew 4, 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy paralytics. And he healed them. Gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. The first installment of the Great Commission, so-called Great Commission, is not Matthew 28, but Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Who knows this commission? They claim Matthew 28 and Mark 16. What about Matthew 10? Matthew 10. The apostles, the twelve apostles of Israel, of Israel, Jesus commissions his twelve apostles. Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. 
Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter. There's Peter. Simon Peter, apostle. Apostle Simon Peter, apostle Peter. Sit one. Matthew 10, 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commended them. He sent them forth apostles, sent ones, saying, He commands them, saying, Matthew 10, 5, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go... Preach, saying, I will die for your sins. Jesus will die for your sins. No. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is this called? Huh? The gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4. Matthew 10.8. As you go preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You have some miracles to confirm the word you're preaching. Matthew 10, 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Mark 3. Mark 3. 14. And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth, apostles, to preach. And to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. Simon, he surnamed Peter. Mark 16. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What gospel? It's the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24, 14. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Luke 8. Luke chapter 8. Verse... One. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings, good news, gospel, of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. The two signs, the two primary signs of God's earthly kingdom... Isaiah 33, Isaiah 35, and Zechariah 13. Healing the sick and casting out devils. Corresponding to Moses and Exodus 4. Snake handling and healing of leprosy. A snake, the type there being of the devil... And the leprosy, the type of sin. God can deliver Israel into that literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic, Israeli kingdom of spiritual healing and blessing. And he proves it with physical healing. See, those miracles. In Matthew to John, the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. John 4, verse 48.
Mark 16, they went forth, preaching everywhere, and the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. That's early Acts. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 onward. Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His will. Holy Ghost miracles. That's early Acts. Acts 2 on. Hebrews 6, verse 5. They have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. The powers of the world to come. Acts 2, verse 43. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. They authenticate, they validate, they verify their ministry and message or truth. Acts 4. We will remember in Acts 3 there, the healing of the lame man. Peter heals the lame man, a type of Israel there. And kingdom blessing, kingdom restoration. Acts 4, 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word and by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. In Acts 5 here, verse 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. See? 15, Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. See, the sick and the devil possessed. Heal the sick and cast out devils. Handle snakes and cure leprosy, Moses. See? Acts 6, verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Acts 8, verse 6, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. So in light of all of that, we have two miracles of Peter. Again, the Apostle Peter, the head of Israel's Apostles. These two miracles of Peter in Acts 9 to cause Israel to believe. One, a paralytic is cured. Two, a dead person is brought back to life. There is a dispensational significance to these two miracles of Peter here in Acts 9. Though the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, has been saved and commissioned and the mystery program 
in effect. Now, Paul going to the Gentiles. Preaching the gospel of the grace of God. The dispensation of grace is open. While that is true, it will not always be true. Think about it. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing is much more than, well, this is the Old Testament and here's the New Testament. And we're not the Old Testament church, we're the New Testament church. No, that's all faulty anyway. Rightly dividing the word of truth is more than just differentiating between truth and error. That's, that, that's shallow. Okay? We separate truth from truth. That is, just because something is true on the Bible timeline at some point, that does not mean it's always true or that it has always been true God changes his dealings with man as you come up through the Bible timeline start in Genesis and read to Revelation you will notice changes unless you're blind unless you aren't actually reading What is true in time past may not be true in the but now. Read Ephesians 2. And what is true in the but now may not be true in the future. So listen, it's so simple. Watch. Watch and see. It isn't difficult at all when we struggle with this or we don't see it it isn't God's fault okay? natural man thinking is dominating us some denominational mind is misleading us either the preachers the teachers or our own mind is misleading us. Acts 3. Acts 3. 20. Jesus Christ. Verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the world began. This is prophecy. Since God placed Adam on the earth, he has been unfolding the prophetic program. What he has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, his purpose and plan for the earth. Very simple. Contrast that with Romans 16, 25 and 26. Acts 3 is Peter, the Apostle Peter. Romans 16 is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Now, if we can read, I sure hope we can, free from denominational eyeglasses and... Bible ignorance? Watch. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to the gospel. 
my gospel. Paul is restrictive here. Why? Uh, maybe there's more than one gospel in the Bible? Yes. Romans 16, 25. I am referring to my, Paul's gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept Secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So here is the mystery program. Secret. Secret. Mystery doesn't mean hard to understand. It means secret. Secret. The hidden wisdom. While God was revealing prophecy, He was keeping silent. Shh! About mystery. Now, listen. Listen. Think about it. Think, 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 my friend. If I tell you something, and I also not tell you something, those have to be different. What I've told you and what I've kept secret are two sets of information. See? Okay. So, Rightly dividing the word of truth goes beyond, here's the Old Testament, here's the New Testament. Right division involves Ephesians 2, 11, 12, and 13. Time past, divided from, but now, divided from Ephesians 2, 7, ages to come. Time past, but now, ages to come. We also rightly divide in the sense of prophecy, history, prophecy. The prophetic program, if you watched my hands just now, and you know the Bible timeline hidden behind the map there, you will know the order is Prophecy, mystery, prophecy. Why is the prophetic program bisected, divided in half? Because God finally revealed the secret at some point. When was it? It started in Acts 9. So listen. Oh, please get this. So much ignorance. We can dispel it. If we just listen to verses, pure Bible verses, get rid of the denominational eyeglasses. There's a way to look at Jesus Christ, Peter's ministry, according to prophecy. There is another way to view the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's according to Paul and mystery. Okay? It's one more Jesus Christ viewed from two perspectives. Peter and Jesus Christ there. Christ will sit on David's throne. Israel will rise to kingdom glory and be a blessing to all the nations. Okay? We'll keep it basic. Paul and Jesus Christ is Israel having rejected Messiah, that Jesus Christ forms a new body of believers, the church, the body of Christ, of which Jesus Christ is the head. And just as Israel will function in the earth for His glory, the church, the body of Christ, will glorify Him in the heavenly places. Acts 9 While the mystery program is in effect Paul's ministry it will one day close so prophecy can resume start up again where it paused in Acts 2,000 years ago. That delay in prophecy 
Who understands it? Hardly anyone. And it isn't God's fault. Never blame Almighty God. He gives us His Word, the Holy Bible. He gives us His Holy Spirit. And we still wind up confused. It's not God's fault. Way too much bitterness. Alright. So Acts 9. Acts 9, 32. To the end, 43 there. Accentuates or highlights or emphasizes the fact while Paul's ministry is in effect, God has not permanently canceled prophecy. God's finished with Israel. We've replaced Israel. That is nothing but... If we can read, we will notice in Paul's ministry... Paul's epistles, we have not replaced Israel. In the church, the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. In Paul's ministry, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. So how could it benefit us even if we were Israel? <laughs> it wouldn't. What happens is, we don't realize Paul's special ministry and message isolated, rightly divided from the rest of the Bible, and we assume everything in the Bible's the same. No right division. Okay. Although Saul of Tarsus has been converted, while the dispensation of grace is operating, and Saul is going to the Gentiles, right here in Acts 9. Peter is not operating on the basis of the new program. Even in the grace movement, that's not always realized, unfortunately. Okay. Peter and Paul are separate. So don't think of it as, well, now that Paul has a new gospel, Peter's preaching Paul's gospel. Non-right division. See? You mix them up and then guess what? You're back to the one gospel. Erroneous teaching. Acts 9.32 Peter is unaware of any dispensational change. While God's dealings with national Israel are over, and Paul realizes it, Peter will not now continue with Paul. Peter still has his gospel of the kingdom message tell you how I know that as we proceed. While God's dealings with Israel are paused or temporarily suspended, they're not canceled, they're not permanently gone. The dispensational change is temporary. The mystery program has been inserted okay, only for a time and then the mystery program is removed and prophecy Resumes. See, don't think of it as there was prophecy and now mysteries here forever. No, it's prophecy, mystery, prophecy. Romans 9, 10, and 11. Israel's past, present, and future. Prophecies, past, present, and future. Peter 
will heal. Aeneas. What a strange name. Aeneas is a paralytic. Aeneas is a picture of Israel, as is Dorcas, Tabitha there. Acts 9.32 And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda, or Lydda. Peter had been in Jerusalem. Acts 9.27, Galatians 1.18, 19. Peter leaves Jerusalem and travels throughout all quarters. Acts 9.32, in your King James Bible, you see the noun there, quarters, is italicized quarters. That italicized word indicates the Greek book of Acts does not have a corresponding noun here. In other words, there is no Greek word for quarters in Acts 9.32. Our translators inserted, added the word. Why? Because you see, in the Greek language, an adjective can be used in place of a noun. For example, we have an English analogy here. If I say the good die young, the good what? The good people, whatever. The adjective there, good, description, allows you to infer, well, it'd be the good people, the good folks, whatever. You don't have to put the noun there. It's just understood. The good die young, the, the good people. Well, when our King James translators encounter this adjective, for all. In order to complete the thought, see, it, it reads strange, it reads awkwardly, if it's, and Peter passed throughout all, he came, all what? All quarters, okay? So our translators place the noun there for us to make it make sense. To complete the thought, all quarters. Peter was in Jerusalem, and he passes through all quarters. Now, what would be the all quarters? What about the four quadrants of the compass? There's north, there's south, there's west, there's east. Huh. Quarters. So Peter is expanding his ministry outward from Jerusalem. And as he's making his rounds, he winds up in Lydda, or Lydda. This is about 25 miles, or 40 kilometers, to the northwest of Jerusalem. Lida Lida is here. Jerusalem is the star. Lida is here. So Peter has made his way to Lida or Lida. Acts 
Acts 9, 32. He's visiting some saints here, some believers. Messianic Jews. Now, from where did these saints come? Let's try Acts 8, verse 40. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So Philip, Philip was near the road between Gaza and Jerusalem. He met the Ethiopian eunuch there. Azotus is here, the Mediterranean sea coast, and Philip preached all along here to Caesarea, way over here. So Philip is preaching in this area in Acts 8. Philip the evangelist, not the apostle Philip. Peter evidently builds up those saints, the people Philip converted earlier, sometime earlier, three years more. Okay. Aeneas is there in Lydda or Lydda. He's a certain man. Aeneas means praise. Praise. P-R-A-I-S-E. I spell it so you don't think of P-R-A-Y-S. <laughs> it's praise as in praise the Lord. And yes, here, he's kept his bed eight years. He's sick of the palsy. Bedridden eight years. A paralytic. He sprawled out in a bed, a sick bed. And he's helpless, incapacitated, unable, unable to walk, unable to function like a normal person. Hmm. I've said so much about this in our studies. This physical ailment disease represents a spiritual malady. Who is spiritually crippled? Who cannot be God's kingdom of priests in the earth? Israel. Because of sin and satanic corruption, bondage to the evil world system. And he is praised. Israel should be praising God, but can she? No. 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 But Peter's ministry is designed to bring Israel to that place of kingdom restoration. Acts 3 and the lame man there. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy wall salvation in thy gates praise. Mm -hmm. There's kingdom restoration. Israel's restoration. Isaiah 59 at the close, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, verse 7. And give him no rest till he establish and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Well, Israel's apostate. All in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even in Acts. And they refused to hear John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. 
the little flock in early Acts there. Don't want to listen to Stephen. And they don't want to listen to Paul either. Israel is spiritually bedridden. Paralytic. Sick of the palsy. We aren't sick. Oh, yes you are. I'm the physician. I've come to make be well, Israel. Go away, Jesus. We aren't sick. See, that is the deception of works religion. Talk to works religionists today. Me? I've never done anything wrong in all my life. I'm better than this person and that person. Wonderful. You aren't better than the Lord, though. Hmm. See, and that's the key. Saul of Tarsus had to come to that realization. All my righteousness is but dumb. Filthy rags. Saul of Tarsus had to swallow his pride there. Mm. It went down though. I'm a sinner. I need the Savior. I'm on my way to hell. That's what Saul of Tarsus came to understand in Acts 9. As Saul preaches to apostate Israel, all those Jews in those synagogues throughout Acts. That's what he's up against. You don't understand. I was like you. I used to be a goody-goody in religion. That's what Saul would tell them, and they refused to hear. Yeah, there was a believing remnant, but you see what they did in Acts 9, huh? Schemed to kill Saul in Damascus and Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus, we read it, Matthew 4, he healed paralytics. Matthew 8, Matthew 9, Mark 2, Luke 5. Philip healed paralytics in Samaria, Acts 8. Acts 9, 33, eight years, Aeneas has kept his bed. Eight, eight is the number of new beginnings. Seven in the Bible is completion, perfection. Eight. You start again. Israel's new beginning is pictured here in Acts 9, verse 34. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Not St. Peter maketh thee whole. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. Acts 3, Acts 3, 6. Recall the lame man. Acts 3, the lame man sitting just outside of God's presence and blessing. I can't make it in. Of course not. That's what sin is. But here the Holy Spirit through Peter and John minister to the lame man. Here is Israel pictured again. Acts 3, 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 16. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Healing, healing, health, soundness. Acts 3, 8, 
And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. See, that's Israel restored in kingdom glory. Future, future from us. He leaps and he praises God. He walks, he leaps, and he praises God. Well, look, poor Aeneas here. He can't walk, he can't leap, he can't praise God. Not yet. Until Peter gets a hold of him. Acts 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. The name of Jesus Christ. And you see, over and over and over, it's Jesus Christ, Acts 3. Jesus Christ, Acts 4. Jesus Christ. See? Acts 9. Okay. Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans 11 is Israel's future. You will notice Paul is writing Romans 11. Paul, our apostle, affirms we are not Israel, we have not replaced Israel, the prophetic program will continue at some point. Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall Israel? God forbid! They didn't stumble and fall at the cross, they stumbled at the cross. Christ's earthly ministry, Romans 9. 32, 33. But rather, Romans 11, 11, but rather through their fall salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Israel is fallen. And salvation is coming to the Gentiles through Israel's fall. When did Israel fall? Acts 7. When did salvation come to the Gentiles? Acts 9 on Paul. Paul's ministry. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them for the rest of Acts, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? They will be risen again. They're fallen today. Israel's fallen today. Only for a time. Temporary. Romans 11, 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. Paul's provoking ministry there covers the rest of Acts. Acts 9 onward. And Paul is conducting his ministry, his life, in such a way as to appeal to lost Israel. Okay? To try to convert those lost Jews to join the church, the body of Christ. Okay? Romans 11, 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? They will be resurrected nationally here. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. See, the fall of Israel. 
and thou standest by faith. You nations, you nations of the world, while Israel is set aside, God can deal with all nations equally. Paul's ministry. However, Israel is not set aside forever. Romans 11, 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. The nations have access to God in our dispensation. Not through Israel as a nation, Israel's kingdom, but through Paul's ministry, Israel's fall. But you nations, now this is not the church, the body of Christ. This is the nations of the world, the, the lost people of the world. Romans 11, 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Here's the interpretation. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. And yet, there's such ignorance, huh? This mystery, this secret. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. You think you're Israel. You're somebody you're not. That blindness in part is happened to Israel forever. No. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When God is finished with mystery, the church, the body of Christ is completed. When no one else wants to believe Paul's gospel, that's it. See, Obstinate, stubborn unbelief caused Israel's program to fall away. Well, it will cause our program to fall away too, eventually. And the grace of God that has been extended for 20 centuries now to all the world, grace and peace, long-suffering, is withdrawn. And the dispensation of grace is over, back to prophecy. Romans 11, 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, that's Isaiah 59, like I told you, and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins, new covenant. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, you nations, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all Jew and Gentile alike. Romans 11:33 Oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever amen the doxology there the praise of God. Our apostle writing Romans 11 says whatever Almighty God is doing presently it's only for a time. Temporary. Temporary. 
Israel will rise again. Right now, the mystery program prevents it. God is doing something else. See how we defy? What God did in time past is not what He's doing now. And what He's doing now is not what He will do in the ages to come. Acts 9, 34. Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately, an instant healing. Okay. This isn't a charlatan. Brother, you just didn't have enough faith. Give it time. God works in mysterious ways. In a couple of weeks, you'll see some improvement. Provided you have faith, enough faith. Foolishness. Acts 9.34 Jesus Christ Messiah maketh thee whole Israel arise. See? And make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Get out of that spiritual inability. And the power of the Word of God. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. The Word of God is quick and powerful. Hebrews 4, 12. The Word of God that Peter utters here enables Aeneas to get up like the lame man in Acts 3. Israel restored to service up and there is Israel walking and leaping and praising God like Acts 3 when Messiah comes back Israel will be restored to service he arose immediately Acts 9:34 and all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him, or Saron, and turned to the Lord. Saron, or Saron, was a village near Lydda, or Lydda. This neighborhood, there is Lydda, Lydda. When they saw Aeneas walking, they turned to the Lord. See, there's still a believing remnant farming in Israel. More members of the little flock. They're turning to the Lord. The power is in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what will bring Israel to the point of kingdom, blessing, restoration, glorification. Acts 9, the other miracle of Peter. Acts 9, 36. Now there was at Joppa, Joppa is present day Yaffo, or Jaffa, present Jaffa. It's approximately 13 miles, 21 kilometers northwest of Lydda or Lydda. So Peter goes here about a half day's journey or so to Jaffa. Now Jaffa or Jaffa, Jaffa is on the sea, the Mediterranean sea coast again. Israel will be restored in the future, Aeneas. 
Israel is dead. She will be resurrected in the future. Tabitha Dorcas. This seaport, Joppa. There's a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Now, Tabitha is her Aramaic or Syriac name. It means gazelle, gazelle. Dorcas is the Greek equivalent. That's why she has two names here, two languages. Tabitha, Aramaic, and Dorcas, Greek, gazelle. Both names mean gazelle, the animal. 36. Tabitha is another believer, disciple. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Verse 39. She also made coats and garments. Tabitha pictures, symbolizes, represents believing Israel. She's a disciple. She's full of good works and alms deeds. What happens to her? Acts 9, 37. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Here was a believer in Christ, full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. In case you haven't realized it, She's not a paralytic. What was the paralytic doing? Yes. Earlier in this chapter, uh, in bed, in bed. Lying in bed. What good works can he do? Sick of the palsy, nothing. Tabitha Dorcas, well, she's doing something. She's full of good works and alms deeds. She helps the poor. Alms deeds. She's swift. She's active. She's alert, like a gazelle. Fast. Aeneas. The bedridden paralytic, he was doing nothing. See the contrast? 37, it came to pass in those days. Tabitha Dorcas, she's sick and she dies. Hmm. Whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, verse 13, the saints here, this biblical hall of faith, all these saints of the ages, All these believers in the one true God. Hebrews eleven thirteen, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off by faith. God said it, and whether we see it with physical eyes or not, with spiritual eyes we do see it. 
and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. They're all waiting for New Jerusalem. Revelation 21 and 22. Dorcas died in faith, didn't she? Tabitha Dorcas, 36 and 37. She was a certain disciple. She had good works and alms deeds here, full of good works and alms deeds. Came to pass, she grew sick and she died. Died in faith, not having received the promises. Did Israel's believing remnant see the promises fulfilled in Acts? Did the kingdom of God come literally, physically, visibly in Acts? No. They died before. That kingdom is still delayed. Where is it? It's coming. Right now, God is doing something else. Hmm. Paul's ministry. Acts 9, 37. They wash her corpse and they lay her in an upper chamber. A second floor room. Here's a, a cultural note. In Jerusalem, a Jewish body had to be buried the same day. We're not in Jerusalem, huh? We're in Joppa. So the time was extended to three days. Within three days, the body must be buried. So they don't bury her, they put her in cold storage. Not literally, but they save her body. Why? Acts 9, 38, and for as much as Lydda Lydda was nigh to Joppa, half day's journey, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. He's still in Lydda, Lydda, with Aeneas. The apostle Peter isn't far away. Go get him. Acts 9, 38. They hear that Peter was there. They sent unto him two men, messengers, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping. This sounds just like Christ's earthly ministry. It's the same gospel message, the gospel of the kingdom, and the same miracles of the gospel of the kingdom. Listen. 39. Peter enters that upper room, upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping. This is a large commotion. Peter hears sobbing, crying, wailing. Women here bawling their eyes out.
having a memorial here, memorial service, remembering Dorcas. All the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. These coats here, these undergarments, close-fitting undergarments. And then we have, we have these garments here, long outer clothing. Dorcas made these Peter, when she was with us. Matthew 9. Matthew 9. Read Matthew 9, verses 18. Through 31, we have two miracles of Christ. One, there's a sick and dying daughter. The father, Jairus, appeals to Jesus, come heal my daughter. Jesus walks to the house and as he makes his way, to cure that little girl, 12 years old, there's a picture of Israel. There's a woman who interrupts. She has an issue of blood. And she reaches out in faith to touch Jesus' him, his righteousness. There's the believing remnant in Israel. And while he's making his way to the house to cure the little girl, Jesus is stopped to deal with the woman with the issue of blood. She delays him to the point when now the little girl is dead. So what? It's not a problem for him, whether she's sick and dying or just deceased or dead a hundred years. No problem for the Lord. So he enters Matthew 9, the Lord enters the room they're making a noise. Matthew 9, 25. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. In Mark 5. Mark 5, 37, here's what we learn. And Jesus suffered no man to follow him save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So Peter was with Jesus when Jesus raised the little girl of Jairus. That's Israel's resurrection. He forms the believing remnant. And then he raises national Israel. The woman with the issue of blood healed first. And then the little girl brought back to life. See it? See the order? This isn't coincidence. Look, some nice little stories to tell old ladies and children in Sunday school. No, the Bible is, it's God's book. Okay. Whatever is in the Bible is important. We shouldn't take it lightly. It's there for a reason, not to fill up space, but to teach, to teach something. Okay. 
Luke 7. Luke 7. You can read that. Luke 7, 11 to 18. The widow in Nain, her only son is dead. And there's a funeral. There's a funeral procession. Jesus comes in. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And up he comes. <gasps> Peter was present with the Lord there too. That's also a picture of Israel's resurrection in the ages to come. John 11, Lazarus, we call Lazarus, John 11, the first 44 verses, that is a picture of Israel, also God's friend dead, Christ is moved emotionally and he raises Lazarus. Lazarus come forth out of the grave and he's been dead four days. So what? So we have a little girl who died. Jesus calls her back to life not long after. There's the son there of the widow of Nain. He's been dead for a day or so. He's raised. And then Lazarus, in four days, he's raised again. Elijah and Elisha raised people from the dead. 1 Kings 17, 2 Kings 4. Paul will raise a dead person in Acts 20. Those are all the Holy Spirit conveying doctrine. Some teaching worthy of faith or trust. A message. Acts 9. Acts 9, 40. But Peter put them all forth. Okay. All of you women. All you widows. You have to go out, out of the room. Acts 9, 40. Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. The Lord Jesus never knelt down and prayed like this with reference to a miracle. But see, Peter does. And turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, Arise. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. The word of God is quick and powerful. Hebrews 4, 12. And as the word of God leaves Peter's lips again, as with an S. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And the power of God enters in Aeus's body and cures it. Well, this woman, Tabitha Dorcas, she's dead. But the life of Almighty God 
in the Word of God, in the lips of Peter, go out, enter the dead body of Tabitha Dorcas, and enlivens it. And the dead lives. Acts 9.40, and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. So she was lying out, and suddenly, a corpse. She's not dead. She's alive. Hmm. Acts 9, 41. And he gave her his hand. The personal touch. Jesus would use his hands to heal. Matthew 9, Mark 5, Luke 8, Matthew 8, Matthew 9, Mark 1, Mark 6, Mark 7, Mark 8, Mark 9, Luke 4, Luke 13. He touched them and they were made well. Peter, Present when Jesus raised Charis' daughter from the dead and the widow of Nain's son from the dead and when Lazarus was raised from the dead, Peter saw all those. And what happens? Now Peter has his miracle in Matthew 10, verse 8, you apostles, you raise the dead. Peter did it. Peter did it. Acts 9. Israel is resurrected. Acts 9, 40. Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called, the saints and widows presented her alive. Yes. John 11, Lazarus. John 11, 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. And that's Lazarus living there. That's why they believed on the Lord Jesus. He saw the miracle. John 12, verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Because of Aeneas' recovery, Acts 9.35, all that dwelt Lydda and Saren saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, they're believing in the Lord here because of Tabitha Dorcas raised again. Another miracle of Peter. This pictures Israel's resurrection, national resurrection. The Valley of the Dry Bones. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, 1. 
The hand of the Lord was upon me, the prophet Ezekiel, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of dry bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, they were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy, preach unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. See, the words of the Lord leave Ezekiel's lips. The power is not in Ezekiel, or Peter, or Paul, or any of them. It's the power of God. It's God's power. Ezekiel 37, 5, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath, they're dead, huh? Bones, skeletons. I will cause breath, <sighs> see, the breath of life. God, the living God, who can give life to dead sinners. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Think about the little girl, the widow's son, Lazarus, Tabitha Dorcas. Okay? Those all fit with this. Ezekiel 37, 6. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you. The recovering of the body, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now what does that mean? Okay. What do we do? We keep reading. Keep reading. The Bible will interpret it. Here is, here is the tempting approach. We stop reading there and we say, well, let's just make something up. Here's what it means. <laughs> I said, Jesus, reading something into the text. And listen, my friend. See, the average person, they won't keep reading. They'll just listen to the preacher or priest or pope or whoever interpret the verse. And, well, I hope that was right. <laughs> I hope so, too. But I don't think they taught the verse correctly. It was most likely out of context. Keep reading. Watch. Ezekiel 37, 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man... These bones are the whole house of Israel. No lost tribes. All twelve tribes. These bones represent the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, new covenant, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. If you read the remainder of Ezekiel 37, there's kingdom restoration. And the 
ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes reunited. One kingdom again. That's all pictured in early Acts. Brought back to the promised land and filled with God's life. So Tabitha Dorcas symbolizes Israel's resurrection. Brought back into the land and now spiritually enabled not only to live but to walk and praise God. And yes, see? This is Peter's ministry. But see, Paul's gospel is not involved in any of this because Paul's gospel is not about the nation Israel. See? see? Paul's gospel does not bring Israel to the place of kingdom glory. Peter's gospel does. See? Acts 9. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. She's alive. And it came to pass, 43, that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Chapter 10, verse 6. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. Simon, a tanner. Now, this is not Simon the sorcerer of Acts 8. This is not Simon Peter, the apostle. This is Simon a tanner. His job here. He converts animal hides into leather. Now, the goody-goody Jews, the Pharisees, were so strict, Simon the tanner is unclean. But see, Peter knows God wants this man instructed in his ways. So Peter spends many days in Joppa with one Simon the tanner. We don't know how many days. I will say this, in Acts 9, verse 23, many days is three years, Galatians 1, 18. So many days, in Acts 9, 43, how many days, I don't know. Peter's ministry will continue in Acts 10 and Cornelius in Caesarea. Okay. Now we're finished with Acts 9. If you want to hang on for a little while longer, I will continue developing More about the dispensation of grace and how it closes. Okay. If you talk to the average believer, teacher, preacher, church member, whoever, ask them about the event commonly known as the rapture. Through these decades and centuries, there has been much confusion. About the rapture. Now why would that be? Uh, because of failure to rightly divide the word of truth. Surprise! Many a heresies arise because of a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. 
dispensational Bible study will liberate us from the shackles, the chains of denominational bondage, only if we want it, only, 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 we have to want it. Okay. As we've made note already when we started Acts 9, According to the prophetic program, let me remove the map there. All this time I've been pointing to the timeline and now you can see it. The Bible timeline. You notice we have these red lines. There's Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to John, Acts, Romans through Philemon, Hebrews to Revelation. Okay. You will notice there's prophecy on the left, prophecy on the right, the mystery in the middle. According to prophecy, the prophetic program, what the prophets saw was the sufferings of Christ, the cross, and the glory that should follow the crown. 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. The tree and the throne, suffering glory. Paul's ministry, the secret, was not made known to the prophets. The mystery program is separate, 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 separate from prophecy. There was nothing in the prophetic program pre-Paul, pre-Saul of Tarsus, before Saul of Tarsus, to indicate that Jesus Christ would come to save Saul of Tarsus according to a new dispensation. All they knew was the prophetic program. But when the prophetic program reached the point where Israel refused to convert and rejected all three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the twelve apostles slash Stephen, now, with the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, Saul cannot be forgiven. But with a new dispensation, he can be forgiven. And he was forgiven. The church, the body of Christ, begins. Okay. There was nothing in prophecy to indicate Jesus Christ would return prior to his second coming to set up the kingdom, literal, physical, visible, earth, the king. Jesus Christ would return would return before that and save Saul of Tarsus. Okay. Just as the beginning of the dispensation of grace was a secret coming of Christ, the start of the dispensation of grace was a secret. The dispensation of grace was a secret. Well, the closure of the dispensation of grace is also a secret. Also separate from prophecy. And that's where the confusion comes in is because you see if all we study is time past and the ages to come and we don't see Paul as special unique oh he's one of the twelve he's an extension of the twelve if we look at it like that all we'll see is there's one future coming of Christ okay and that's the coming in wrath and judgment to set up the kingdom. But if we realize there was a secret coming to save Saul of Tarsus and start the body of Christ, there's also a secret coming to stop forming the church, the body of Christ. Okay? Now, 
read these verses first. 1 Corinthians 3, and listen, listen. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me. Who, who, who's the me? Paul. As a wise master builder. Paul was given the blueprints. God is building. God is working. And God gave some grace to Paul, a ministry. Paul, here are the directions for the dispensation of grace. What I'm doing to form the church, the body of Christ, the heavenly people. Okay. 1 Corinthians 3.10, listen. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, the wisdom of God, the wisdom given to Paul, 2 Peter 3. Peter confessed it. The wisdom given to our beloved brother Paul. Paul is the wise master builder. I have laid the foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul is not the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Watch out. Be careful. Be careful. Watch out. Be vigilant. Be cautious. Remember what I've said already about it. There is far, far too much careless walking through the scriptures. And what I mean by that is, remember the child in the candy store. I want, I want, I want, I want. Uh -huh. And when we, when we open the Bible, the denominational approach is, give me that verse. I want to believe that and do that. No, not that one. Keep flipping. I'll look for something else. I, I favor that. But not the next verse. Leave that be for someone else. I want all the blessings. Leave the curses for someone else. I want this prayer promise. I want this. I want that. See, and so what we've done is we've found verses. We're biblical. Absolutely, we're biblical. But is it enough? It isn't. Remember that. Grabbing something from the Bible without the context makes us con men. If we find it in the Bible, oh, God did it in time past. He will do it in the ages to come. But is that right now His will? If it's His will for the past or His will for the future, then we aren't in His will if we follow that. Okay? So... Here is the Holy Spirit through Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Take heed, take heed, how he buildeth thereupon. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. But it's not Jesus Christ according to the prophetic program. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We read it, Romans 16, 25. If we take Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, that's Jesus Christ according to prophecy, and put him as our foundation and the dispensation of grace, and how many have done it, uh, that's building on the wrong right foundation. The right foundation is Jesus Christ, but it's wrong because it's Him according to prophecy and we should be building according to mystery. All right. <laughs> First Corinthians three twelve. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, 
wood, hay, stubble. Three valuable materials, three junk materials. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 2 Corinthians 5. This is also Romans 14. The judgment seat of Christ. All members of the church, the body of Christ, those who have believed Jesus Christ, died for their sins, he was buried and he rose again the third day, if they trusted that alone for their eternal salvation, justification, redemption, forgiveness. They are headed to the judgment seat of Christ, not to be confused with the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, which is for the lost or unsaved of the ages. That's something else. Don't worry about that. 2 Corinthians 5. 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There's some good and there's some bad done in all believers. Now, what do you believe would be those good and bad things. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 3, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. See, three good, three bad. All right. The good, the good is sound Bible doctrine, spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding. And that's in the context of Paul's ministry and message, Romans through Philemon. The wood, hay, and stubble, the worthless material, is anything but the Word of God rightly divided. Everything but the Word of God rightly divided. So, when we have our philosophy, or our religious tradition, our scientific method, our soul searching, all of that, you know what that is? That is not what God is doing, and it's wood, hay, stubble. Okay. And there's a loss of reward. Colossians 3. The Christian does not go to hell, but he or she does lose reward in heaven. In the context of 1 Corinthians 3, the Corinthians are confused. Like the professing church today. And Corinth is in spiritual shambles. They, they're carnal, they're worldly, fleshly. And the Holy Spirit through Paul says, watch out, be careful. You're building up trash in your inner man. It's not the Holy Spirit, so it will not be the Christian life. Be careful. What has the professing church done for 2,000 years? Ignored, ignored. We want to follow Jesus in His earthly ministry. Watch out! See? They ignore his heavenly ministry, don't they? Paul's ministry. We don't worship Paul. Paul is not our Savior. Paul is not God. But Paul is God's spokesman to us. If any man think himself to be spiritual or a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 
1 Corinthians 14, 37 and 38, there's a lot of that, huh, ignorance. We don't care about what the Lord says through Paul. We want to follow Jesus. Okay, go ahead. Follow his earthly ministry. Would he stumble? It's not gold, silver, precious stones. It's not what God is doing now. All right. So because we fail to make that distinction between Paul and the rest of Scripture, Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and Jesus Christ according to prophecy, we don't make that distinction, that difference. Well, then we're forced to conclude there's just the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. There is no secret coming for Paul. Well, there had to have been, huh? Well, there's also another secret coming of Christ to stop the body of Christ from forming. And that is a Pauline revelation. And what happens is, since we don't fully appreciate Paul's special message, oh yeah, we'll study Paul here and there. Everybody quotes the Pauline epistles to some extent. But they aren't separating him from the rest of the Bible. You see, it's been argued, I've heard it before, yeah, we follow the writings of Paul. You do? No, you don't. No, you don't. You just follow what Paul tells you that you want to believe and practice. See that? Hmm. Anyway, my time is going. Christian people tend not to see the importance of the rapture. If they see it, they confuse it with the second coming. Some just outright deny it altogether. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is not his second coming in wrath, war, judgment. This is his coming for the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery. What's that? A secret. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on in corruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's a secret. You notice that? 51. A secret. A secret resurrection. Now, if the Holy Spirit is telling us the truth, I assume he is, through Paul here, we... Gather, there is a mystery or secret resurrection. Now, think about this. This is oh so complicated. If the prophetic program has a resurrection in view, but Paul writes here, I show you a secret resurrection, could, could they be the same? Uh, no, no. A prophetic resurrection and a mystery resurrection are different. One is spoken, one is kept secret. Paul 
writes of a mystery resurrection, secret resurrection, secret, secret, secret. That's the key. And see, that separates Paul from a prophetic resurrection. Philippians. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Resurrection. We're waiting for the Savior. We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his coming for us. We aren't waiting for any Christ. We aren't looking for any Christ. Prophecy is not fulfilled today. This is mystery. The prophetic program is paused, postponed, not canceled, delayed. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, no. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now what is that wrath to come? It's not hell. It's not hell. The wrath to come in the context of Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians, the wrath to come is the baptism with fire. Matthew 3, Luke 3. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, that wrath was what they were waiting for in Acts. Told you about it. Should have got Saul of Tarsus. It didn't. Why? Dispensational change. Grace, mercy, and peace prevented wrath, judgment, and war. And has for 2,000 years. Okay. We have to separate us from the prophetic program. And there's far too much of, well, the body of Christ will go into part or all of Daniel's 70th week. And when Jesus comes for us, that's his second coming to found the kingdom. <laughs> Ignorance! Ignorance! Daniel's 70th week. The Antichrist is Jacob's trouble. It concerns Read Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Daniel's people, Israel, and the holy city, Jerusalem. We aren't part of the prophetic program. If we don't see that, we'll put ourselves into the future part of the prophetic program. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. <laughs> and there's plenty of it, isn't there? Ignorant, brethren. Plenty of it. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the coming of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Rapture, see, caught up. So, caught away. Remember in Acts 8, Philip was caught away. Same word. Caught up. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Second okay. Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit 
nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. Huh? A forged Bible there. Paul didn't write it, but it was attributed to him falsely as that the day of Christ is at hand. Someone was teaching false doctrine and using Paul's name. <laughs> if there's a false Bible manuscript when Paul is living, don't you think someone would be forging Bible versions today? Huh? Yeah, see? Look, a holy Bible. No, it's man's words, not God's words. But it's marketed, it's sold as though it is God's word. It isn't deceived. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth, here's the Antichrist, and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, and signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you, by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Huh. At the beginning of the chapter, 2 Thessalonians 1, are gathering together unto Christ, His coming. That is the rapture. Okay. The body of Christ must be closed off. Open 2,000 years, dispensation of grace, in effect, now closed. An event has to close it. We cannot continue on the earth as prophecy resumes. Prophecy can only come once mystery is stopped. Okay? So the church, the body of Christ, must be taken away and brought to the heavenly places, taken from earth. So, all members of the church, the body of Christ, the redemption of our body. Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, Ephesians 4 and so on. The redemption of our body. All dead members of the body of Christ will be resurrected. Those of us who are alive will receive new bodies without dying. Okay? We've read all those verses now. Okay. The poor Thessalonians were confused. What's going to happen to those believers who've died already? You'll see them again. Don't be ignorant, brethren. 1 Thessalonians 4. Well, in 2 Timothy 2, in the context of rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 there, verse 15 you keep reading in the chapter, and there are some false teachers there saying the resurrection is past already. The Thessalonians were under that impression. The rapture is finished. It's already happened. You're living in Daniel's 70th week, and how many ignorant people today looking for the sealed judgments of Revelation 6 as though that's our program. Ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. 2 Thessalonians 2 shows us we are saved from the Antichrist. We're saved from that deception, from that time. How? We're removed from earth. 
God has called us by Paul's gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're patiently waiting for Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. Okay. 1 Timothy 6, verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Timothy. The appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ is not his second coming, but the rapture. Okay. Before Daniel's 70th week unfolds, we are removed. There's an appearing of Christ to close the body of Christ, as there was an appearing of Christ, to open the body of Christ with Saul. See, the two comings. If you don't see the special coming of Christ to save Saul of Tarsus, you won't appreciate his coming to close the body of Christ. See? And you'll mix it all up with the second coming for Israel. Alright. 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. God who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, that appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ was to make Saul the Apostle Paul. The special coming of Christ, the special appearance of Christ to commission Saul of Tarsus. That's Acts 9. 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. Henceforth, Paul is almost dead here about to die, put to death. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Now what's that appearing? Uh, well, it'd be the appearing to open the body of Christ, Saul, converted, saved, Acts 9. could also be the appearance to close the body of Christ. You can't love one coming without the other. And those two comings of Christ, to start the body of Christ and to close the body of Christ, are not to be confounded, confused with the first coming to die and the second coming to reign. See, four appearances, four comings. See that? Only with the mystery do you see the two comings in the middle. Titus 1. Titus 1. 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, not a missionary, an apostle, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. That's Paul's ministry. Promised before the world began, but now in due times. He's the due time testifier, 1 Timothy 2. God has manifested his word through Paul's preaching. See, that's mystery truth. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God, Paul's ministry, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, His coming for us. The rapture. Our gathering together unto Him, who gave Himself for us that 
he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Grace is a license to sin. Huh? Bible ignorance. No, it isn't. You know what is a license to sin? A birth certificate. Hmm. Think about it. The old man inherited from Adam. There's the license to sin. Grace says, that's not who you are anymore. You're a new creature in Christ. Now, not quite finished. Hmm. I hope you're staying with me. I'm tired too. But we continue. Complete the thought. Ephesians 1. Why are we taken to the heavenly places? You see, the rapture is our way of being transported into the heavenly places. If we stay here on earth, we stay on earth up to the second coming. See, without the rapture, we're confined to the earth. And then there's this silly idea, oh, we go meet Jesus in the air as he's coming down and his second coming, and we come back with him on the earth. Now that, that's, that is so preposterous. We go up to come back down with him. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. God has chosen us in Christ, not to be in Christ, but He's chosen those who are in Christ for a purpose. From before the foundation of the world, God planned the mystery program but did not reveal it until Paul. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. See that again, heavenly places, places italicized. That's that same idea of the adjective in Greek functioning as the now, heavenly what? See, heavenly is plural. Well, our English translators inserted places. See, it's not just in the heavenlies. That's nonsense in English. It's the heavenly what? Heavenly places. Okay, and that ties us into Revelation 12. Satan's place is found no more in heaven. Our place is we replace him. God is forming the church, the body of Christ, the heavenly, 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 heavenly people. Not earthly, that's Israel, but a heavenly people. You read at the close of Ephesians 1, the governmental offices in heavenly places are given to us. Church, the body of Christ. Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. See, heavenly places. Ephesians 3.10, heavenly places. Ephesians 6, high places. Verse 12, same as heavenly, heavenly places. When God is finished forming His heavenly people on the earth, He will take them into the heavenly places, install them in heaven's governments, Daniel's 70th week unfolds on the earth. Christ returns to save Israel and form an earthly people. And now the dispensation of the fullness of times is underway. When Jesus Christ is glorified, Ephesians 1, in heaven through us and earth, Israel. Ah, okay. 
We are Israel. We have not replaced Israel. The dispensation of grace dispensation of grace will not last forever. God will return to prophecy in due time. He will restore Israel. He will resurrect Israel to service Peter's ministry at the end of Acts 9, those two miracles that we just expounded. Huh. Praise the Lord. Okay. I'm tired. Acts 9. Finished. Thank you, Father God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you in chapter 10. And the conversion of Cornelius.